Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Reshma Parekar, a pharmaceutical physician and a medical advisor for Lupin Phoenix, a women's health division. It's our immense pleasure to welcome all of you for the today's eSampark educational platform, an initiative of with Foxy on the topic of thin endometrium. Endometrium plays a vital role in the reproductive cycle of a woman's life. It's an innermost lining of the uterus. Each month, it goes under self-renovation and sheds off, which is known as menstruation. If pregnancy does not occur, the endometrium sheds. And this process is known as menstruation. From to today's session, let's understand the importance of endometrium and if there is any consequences and if it thins out, then what would be the consequences and causes and what would be the treatment options. Today, we have Dr. Shivani Sachdev Gaur with us who will, uh, who will lighten us on this topic. She has completed her MD and DNB in obstetrics and gynecology and is a member of RCOG. She is a director at SCI Healthcare, a founder secretary for Delhi State Chapter of ESAR, Secretary Delhi State Chapter ISPAT, General Secretary IN Star, ex Vice President Delhi Gynecology Forum South, Vice Chairperson for Women Doctor Wing IMA South Delhi. I welcome Dr. Shivani. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Dr. Reshma, and thank you very much to our wonderful president, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, sir, and Foxy for this initiative. Thank you to Lupin. And uh, the topic today is something which is um, very commonly faced by us, and I hope to give you an overview and also some specific diagnostic tests and the role of various interventions in, in endometrium. So I'm just going to... Right. So, as we all know, a human endometrium is the last barrier to progress in assisted reproduction technologies. The key components for a successful embryo implantation are a competent embryo and a receptive endometrium. The competent embryo and receptive endometrium are always in an intimate crosstalk. Now, implantation rate is only 25% if we see IVF cycles, maximum about 50% per transfer, even with the use of PGTA. So, what is the cause for this low success rate? In two-thirds of cases, inadequate uterine receptivity is responsible. In one-third of cases, it is the embryo. So, a normal endometrium requires a structure, function, dating, which is histological and molecular, this depends on sequential action of estrogen, progesterone, and a coordination of molecular events. The most recent publication that I found, Fertility Stability 2019 by Kilman Evaluation of Endometrium, describes it as a fruitcake model, where there is two cellular compartments, epithelial glands, and mixed stroma. The glands finish their visible function on cycle day 19. They go from straight to coil to bent, with subnuclear vacuoles, which is a sign of progesterone secretion, mitotic figures. The stroma begins to transform the endometrium from a receptive to an invasion resistant deciduralized barrier, and by cycle day 28, there is breakdown. There is also a molecular dating of the endometrium, which Kilman has published. In this, we have the role of cyclin E, mouse ascites, called the progesterone receptors, estrogen receptors and various uh, factors like LIF, HOXA-10, and AVB3 integrin. So endometrial disorders in infertile women can be classified as a growth disorder, reduction in endometrial receptivity, embryo endometrial asynchrony in ART. Growth disorders include thin endometrium, estrogen receptor defect, progesterone anomalies. Uh, they could also include receptivity disorders like polyp, fibroid, adenomyosis, chronic endometritis, and asynchrony is when there is elevated progesterone levels before the ovulation trigger. So, endometrial thickness is one of the most frequently used indirect predictors of endometrial receptivity. A thin endometrium is often defined as either less than 7 millimeters or less than 8 millimeters in thickness. The prevalence of this abnormal or thin endometrium varies with age. 5% of younger women, 25% in older women. 
what is the cutoff value for implantation? There is absolutely no value. Women have achieved pregnancy at endometrium of even 5 millimeters. There's pregnancy reported even at 4 millimeters. So Tech and Cohen described it as 4 to 5 millimeters. Alam at 6 millimeters. Kreitler, 7 millimeters. And what is the optimum endometrium? Anywhere between 9 to 14 millimeters. Uh, if we see the evidence, what is the published data on this? Liu et al. have published a huge study. They had more than 40,000 embryo transfers were analyzed. In fact, this is a most commonly quoted study when we are talking about thin endometrium. And this looks at both fresh cycles and frozen thaw IVF outcome. So on the left hand side, fresh IVF ET, clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rate are reduced and the pregnancy loss rate is increased with each millimeter decline below 8 millimeters. And the same is true for frozen embryo transfer. The cutoff is considered to be 7 millimeters. So they are different for a fresh cycle and for a frozen cycle. So if you see the odds ratio and all the prospective studies, the retrospective studies which have been published, uh, they look at a cutoff of endometrial thickness of less than 7 or equal to 7 millimeters where the success rates are lower and above 7 millimeters where the success rates are supposed to be good. Endometrial thickness and pregnancy rates after idea of a systematic review and meta-analysis published in human reproduction. Again, for IUI cycles, so not all cycles are going to be ART. What about IUI? How thick is too thin? Does the endometrial thickness have any impact on IUI success rate? So this is a meta-analysis which was published in Human Reproduction in 2017. And there are uh, uh, several studies which have been included in this. And um, basically what was, uh, although the conclusion, I haven't written, the conclusion that they found was that there is no defined uh, thickness below which the success rate of IUI is considered to be lower. So just like in IVF, we have defined thickness for fresh and frozen in IUI, there is no defined uh, thickness. Now what are the causes of thin endometrium? It could be permanent damage to the basal endometrium or a resistance to the effect of estrogen, reduction in the blood flow, overexposure of testosterone, Various syndromes like Turner's, Kalman's, idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, premature ovarian failure, use of birth control pills, estrogen-induced endometrial proliferation in large part depends on the blood flow to this basal endometrium. So how do you diagnose by history that the woman might be having an endometrial defect? The major presentation of thin endometrium is an unexplained low-volume menstrual blood that is less than 30 ml. The menstrual cycle will be normal, sexual hormone levels will be normal, but it is just the history of the woman that she has a low volume of menstruation. On hysteroscopy, we will see a pale, thin, smooth endometrium with or without any adhesions. What are the consequences of thin endometrium? It could be that there are no consequences at all, that the woman has uh, no impact on the pregnancy outcome, but more likely, she could suffer from miscarriage, infertility, reduction in success rate of assisted conception techniques, ectopic pregnancy, a twofold increase in low birth weight, preterm delivery, significantly higher risk of IUGR and adverse perinatal outcome. What is the mechanism of implantation in thin endometrium? What gets affected? What happens is that there is a defective vascularization during the invasive phase. The embryos which are closer to the spiral arterioles and higher oxygen concentration on the basal layer of the endometrium. And this is supposed to reduce the implantation rates. On Doppler study, the major features that we see in thin endometrium cases are a high uterine blood flow resistance. And histologically, there is delayed growth, growth of the glandular epithelium. This inhibits the expression of BEGF, poor growth, and that is how the vicious cycle starts. So poor growth of the blood vessels, poor perfusion, thin endometrium. So this is a vicious cycle, uh, which I have just described in the previous slide. Uh, this is again a, a graph where uh, pathophysiology of thin endometrium was uh, presented by Ichiro Miwa et al. in fertility and sterility. And here you see the area of glandular epithelial cells, the number of blood vessels, all are reduced in women with thin endometrium. So what investigation should be done? 
the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society has published one of the most extensive reviews on thin endometrium and I have quoted a lot from this literature in this presentation. Many of the potential risk factors for thin endometrium will be identified from the patient's history. It's difficult to estimate the incidence of intrauterine pathology with thin endometrium. Uterine cavity assessment by hysteroscopy or sonohistogram is considered to be low risk and this can identify conditions of adhesions which may require a surgical management. Now, chronic endometritis is very important in the Indian context, although uh, there are um, studies which have said that um, it, may, it has not really been identified as a contributing factor and there is no uh, specific treatment which has been defined for this. On the role of ultrasound, there is a lack of randomized control trials, there is no established threshold and there is no consensus whether that triple layer pattern, if it is seen, whether that can predict your treatment outcome. Again, on Doppler, there is lack of adequate predictive ability on the IVF outcome, although personally, whenever I am doing treatment, I will always check the Doppler blood flow pattern, zone 1, zone 2, zone 3, and zone 4, because if the patient has reduced blood flow, he has a higher risk of miscarriage later when she gets pregnant. So the subendometrial blood flow distribution is important not only for predicting success rate, but also for uh, risk of miscarriage. So what are the investigations that you would do? Investigations are the first one is a basic ultrasound scan where the endometrium should be measured transvaginally in sagittal plane in the thickest part near the fundus, not exactly at the fundus, just below it. If there is a thin endometrium, try and repeat your measurement after a few days. The assessment of the uterine cavity by hysteroscopy or sonohistogram can also be done because it's a relatively non-invasive procedure. This can give you an idea about fibroids, polyps, intrauterine adhesions, which may happen in women, especially with history of previous surgeries. Now, a little bit about chronic endometritis. The gold standard for diagnosis of chronic endometritis is detection of CD138 cells in the endometrial stroma. However, if you have put a hysteroscope, please try and see if the endometrial cavity is it pink and soft and healthy or does it have some red angry inflamed areas does it have small micro polyps or any other uh, abnormality like small cysts all these could be a sign of chronic endometritis histopathologically the pathologist should look for um, damaged surface epithelium and there are certain tests which can check for LIF expression, estrogen receptor hyperexpression. So diagnosis is basically a combination of histoscopy, histology, and if possible, a CD138 testing. So nowadays, there is a lot of probiotics which have come into the market and a lot of uh, these products are available. So this is the endometrial microbiota. It's the newest player in town. As we all know, upper reproductive tract is not sterile. The emerging evidence has shown presence of both lactobacillus and non-lactobacillus species. And NGS testing of our RNA has shown that L lactobacillus has a relative abundance as compared to other bacteria. And there is a cutoff value which is 90% which predicts reproductive success. If the environment is non-lactobacillus dominated, if it is less than 90%, then there is a chance of adverse reproductive outcome that is predictive of uh, problems in implantation, increased miscarriage rates as compared to women who have a lactobacillus dominated microbiota. And this is why the probiotics are being nowadays prescribed increasingly. Endometrial microbiota in infertile women with and without endometritis by using a quantitative and reference range. This was published in Fertility Sterility by Liu in 2019. The endometrial biopsy and fluid was collected seven days after the LH surge and plasma cell was detected. It can be seen on a simple histopathology. And CD138 for this, there is a histochemistry specific stains. So chronic endometritis is diagnosed if the plasma cell level was above the 95th percentile. So instead of going for advanced CD138 tests, a simple presence of plasma cells on the histology slide can help you to diagnose chronic endometritis.
Now, looking at uh, thin endometrium in non-IVF cases. So, um, should you proceed or should you cancel? For example, you are doing a ov ovulation induction with clomiphene. So, what is the role of adjuvants in this? The role of adjuvants along with non-IVF like clomiphene or just an IUI cycle has not been studied. A one randomized control trial of 136 patients evaluated the use of aspirin with thin endometrium where they suggested that there is a higher pregnancy rate. There are several case reports published with sildenafil also. Uh, Bang et al. Uh, then suggested tamoxifen HMG to be better versus clomiphene and HMG. Low, live birth rates are much lower with uh, IUI versus IVF, which may account for the lack of effect of thin endometrium in IUI. And the prognosis for achieving a thicker endometrium in subsequent cycles is not clear. The effect of endometrial thickness on outcomes has been, has been described in IUI cycle, but most of these studies are retrospective. And as I've said, there is no cutoff level for IUI in these cases. Uh, endometrial thickness as a biomarker for ongoing pregnancy in IUI with unexplained infertility was published in Human Reproduction just this year, in 2020. And women with unexplained infertility who underwent IUI, endometrial thickness and the ongoing pregnancy rate is not found to be associated. And thin endometrium had no impact on pregnancy rates, irrespective of whether the patient received only clomiphene citrate or gonadotrophins. So, um, this is a summary of all the findings. Again, this is from the Canadian uh, review. Um, when you compare clinical pregnancy rate where the endometrial thickness was used, cutoff was used as 7 millimeters, uh, cutoff used as 8 millimeters, cutoff used as 6 millimeters, it was found that there is no difference between the two groups. So the impact of the endometrial thickness seems to be very less in non-IVF cycles as compared to IVF cycles. Now, what are the therapeutic options? What is the strategies that we have available to manage a refractory or a thin endometrium? So the various strategies include higher doses of estradiol, long course of estradiol, vaginal route of estradiol, a systemic route of HCG, intrauterine PRP, intrauterine GCSF, use of GNRH analog, vitamins, supplements, aspirin, nitroglycerin patches, vitamin E, L-arginine, pentoxifiline, sildenafil, and surgical strategies like hysteroscopy, autologous bone marrow. Nowadays, we don't say stem cells because the, the law regarding stem cells, there is some new notification which had come at the time of the lockdown in March 2020. So we call it autologous bone marrow derived cells. And lastly, uterine transplantation. So let us come to the first and the most commonly used medication, which is estradiol. The most commonly used strategy by us is an extended estrogen administration for women with thin endometrium. When we look at pros and thought embryo cycles, this paper was published in 2006, where the mean endometrial thickness increases significantly from 6.7 to 8.6 millimeters if the estrogen therapy is extended for anywhere between 14 to 82 days and the pregnancy rate is significantly higher. But what they have said is that there is a risk of abnormal placentation and its complications like placenta previa in these cases for which we should be careful. Endometrial preparation for third party parenting. Uh, this is one of the studies which uh, looks at uh, women who are undergoing third party transfer. So we assume that the embryo quality is excellent in these cases. So the entire uh, issue will then come about the endometrium. If we add exogenous estrogen to fresh IVF cycles, it is a bit contradictory because it prevents the growth of the follicle. However, uh, this is one of those studies which was published in 2013. 57 patients, 4 milligram estradiol from the day of HCG administration till 12 weeks of gestation. So this is in the luteal phase as compared to 60 patients who did not receive adjuvant therapy. There is no significant difference in endometrial thickness or pregnancy or life birth rate. So most of the normal responders do have an adequate estrogen priming. But the non-responders, the duration of estrogen administration can be increased. There is no upper limit for this duration. Uh, you, if you give it longer than 32 days, you run the risk of breakthrough bleeding. 
and you run the risk of abnormal placentation. The various routes available to us today are oral, transdermal, intramuscular was available. Nowadays, it is not available in India or vaginal route. It's the same oral tablet that is used vaginally. The transdermal route gives the most stable, steady state levels and better receptivity. I'm using a lot of transdermal estradiol nowadays in uh, preparation of endometrium for specially frozen embryo transfers. So, um, from the Canadian guidelines, uh, this is a summary of the luteal phase uh, estradiol compared to no treatment for thin endometrium. So this is where the project estrogen is continued till almost three months of the pregnancy. What they have found is that the quality of evidence is very low for clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate, uh, whether it is with frozen embryo transfer or whether it is with uh, fresh embryo transfer. So um, although the quality of evidence is low, however, there is some small beneficial effect. So in my practice, I am using estradiol level in the luteal phase, estradiol tablets in the luteal phase till almost 12 weeks of pregnancy. Now, next coming to the role of tamoxifen and also the role of gonadotrophins. So this is from Cochrane uh, Register of Control Trials, the RCT, which looked at treatment of tamoxifen in patients with thin endometrium, it was found that tamoxifen pa uh, treated patients required more stimulation days. They needed more gonadotrophin, but they recruited a less follicles larger than 14 millimeters as compared to clomiphen citrate treated patients. However, a significantly increased endometrial thickness and pregnancy rate and reduced miscarriage rate was found, thus improving ongoing pregnancy rate. So, Tamoxifen may not be a first-line treatment, but it is a promising alternative for patients with thin endometrium. This is one of the strategies that I am, all the studies that I have posted, this is one of the strategies that I am using myself. So what we do is that we use gonadotrophin, that is HMG injection in the dose of 150 or 300 IU with antagonists, and you can use it alternate day or daily, and you can start with tamoxifen and then switch on to gonadotrophin, or you can use gonadotrophin in an alternate day manner. What this does is it raises the estradiol level to much higher levels as compared to just with estrogen tablets. And that is how it builds a thicker endometrium. Now, what about the role of HCG? Follicular HCG is used for endometrial priming in IVF patients who have thin endometrium. So this was a study which has a very small number of patients, but they had really good results in these small number of patients. HCG, see the dose of HCG used is only 150 international units of HCG. It is used for estrogen priming for seven days in the proliferative phase of estrogen substituted cycle for frozen embryos transfer. And after a week of estrogen priming, uh, endometrial thickness was then measured and then progesterone injections were initiated. 17% achieved an endometrial thickness more than seven millimeters. 30% approximately did not improve. From the later who be became pregnant, uh, uh, overall 41% of the patients ultimately had a live birth. So the success rate is really high with, with uh, HCG priming. Now, what about the role of GnRH analog? Apparently, GnRH analog, if you use it in the luteal phase, it improves the implantation and pregnancy rates in women with IVF with thin endometrium less than or equal to 7 millimeters on the day of egg retrieval. This is again something which I am using personally. You can use it as 0.1 milligram of triptorelin or luprolide acetate, in which case you can use 0.5 milligram. Just a single dose is given. And this uh, can be given on the day of egg retrieval, embryo transfer, and three days after embryo transfer. If you are doing blastocyst embryo transfer, then one day after the blastocyst transfer. The endometrial thickness increased from 6.89 to 8.92 millimeters in the study group, which is significantly higher than the increase in the control group. How this works? This is supposed to release estradiol because this is the time where the estradiol level drops. So GnRH analog gives a boost of estradiol, and that is what maintains the endometrium. What about aspirin? The most commonly number one used adjuvant in women with thin endometrium, no doubt, is aspirin. 
and there is only one small non-blinded RCT which has evaluated the use of aspirin in patients with thin endometrium. 28 donor oocyte recipients, history of endometrial thickness less than 8 millimeters in the previous cycle, dose was 81 milligram per day of aspirin. No difference was found in the endometrial thickness, pregnancy rate, or the live birth rate. So this was one of the studies. However, there are a lot of other studies which do support the role of low-dose aspirin, uh, like this one, which was published in Human Reproduction. It is hypothesized to increase the endometrial blood flow by reducing the impedance across the uterine artery, and a low-dose aspirin results in lower PI of the uterine artery and improves the pregnancy rate. And despite an increase in the implantation rate, there was only a trend for improvement of the clinical pregnancy rate in the aspirin treatment group. Patients who have thin endometrium, less than 8 millimeters, who undergo COH with IUI were randomized either to receive 100 milligram aspirin starting day one of the cycle till the pregnancy test or no aspirin. And there was no significant difference in the mean endometrial thickness between the two groups, but the clinical pregnancy rate was significantly higher. So aspirin is something which is um, easily available. It's not expensive. And it is something which is worthwhile using. But remember the 75 milligram that single tablet may not be enough. It might be more worthwhile to use two tablets. So a higher dose because in this study it is almost 100 milligram. What I am using is two tablets, 150 milligrams because that is what is available commercially. Now again the Canadian study. This Canadian study was extremely critical of most of these adjuvants and they said that the evidence for aspirin was very low quality although they did find that there was a marginal improvement in live birth rate. What are the other adjuvants? The other adjuvants are pentoxifiline and vitamin E which is tocopherol. So this was a small study published 2009 where there was a 73% improvement in the endometrial thickness and pregnancy in almost 40% of the cases. So we conclude that combination of tocopherol, that is vitamin E, 400 milligram two times a day, can improve the uh, endometrial thickness. Again, another study um, in uh, oocyte donation program. Now the precise mechanism by which this combination interacts with fibrous tissue is not known, but in the porcine model, combined uh, pentoxifiline and vitamin E infuses a significant decrease in TGF beta 1 levels, but no change in the TNF alpha levels, and of course, larger studies are required. What about the role of sildenafil? Sildenafil is used vaginally, and in this study, women who underwent IVF in the long protocol used it as 25 milligram four times a day for three to 10 days. And uh, what was found was that it enhances the endometrial development in almost 70% of patients studied with high implantation rate and ongoing pregnancy rate. However, if the patient has had previous endometritis, these are the ones who will not respond well. I am using sildenafil. I do find that it improves the blood flow significantly and possibly that could also be one of the mechanisms where it improves the success rates. In uh, the Canadian study where uh, they did a meta-analysis, they found uh, that the quality of evidence was little better for sildenafil. So it is not very low, it is in the low category. What about the role of PRP? So many workshops we have also conducted about PRP. How does it work? What it does is there is a high concentration of growth factors in platelet-rich plasma. They are mitogenic, angiogenic cytokines which are promoting receptivity. They have antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory properties and they promote regenerative process. So this is the platelet-rich plasma blood-derived products to improve the endometrial receptivity. This is how it is prepared. There are four different kinds. So there is a pure platelet-rich plasma which is leukocyte poor. There is a pure platelet-rich or leukocyte poor but rich with fibrin. Then there is both leukocyte and platelet-rich, and there is a leukocyte, platelet-rich, poor uh, high-density fibrin plasma. So there are different kinds of plasma. The one that we use is platelet-rich and leukocyte poor. And prerequisite for giving PRP to the patient should be that uh, ideally you should have done hysteroscopy and there should be no endometrial pathology, and uh, there should not be any bacteriological 
uh, growth inside the high vaginal swab or on your uh, histopathology. And the patient should have an endometrial less than 6 millimeters, 0.5 to 1 cc. So you have to take almost 20 ml of blood. From 20 ml, you will get 1 cc of PRP, which is infused in the uterine cavity anyway between day 10 to day 13. And within 48 hours, if the endometrium doesn't increase to a second PRP, and when the endometrium is more than 7 millimeters, embryo is transferred. So there are a lot of studies which are published about the PRP. For example, this study from China, where it's shown that there is an acceleration in the regeneration of endometrium and reduction in the fibrosis. This is the histopathology. So they've uh, published the slides after the PRP. Even in Asherman syndrome, this was a case report where uh, there was moderate Asherman syndrome and they underwent PRP after hysteroscopy, after a visualizes, estrogen treatment 4 mg per day for one month, antibiotics 7 days, intrauterine balloon placement 7 days. And this was uh, where they achieved success at the age of 40 years. One case reported spontaneous conception, other conceived after IVF twin pregnancy. So should we consider alternative therapies to operative hysteroscopies uh, as an alternative to hysteroscopy in the treatment of Ashamans? The success of PRP depends on the presence of endometrial differentiated resident and progenitor cells from which the cells will degenerate. So the application of PRP on unhealthy scar tissue is absolutely useless. So it is very limited success. So if you have a case of Ashaman syndrome, unless there is a hysteroscopy which is done and the adhesions are cleared, PRP is considered to be useless. Now there are many problems with PRP. What is the ideal concentration? Which technique is better? There are so many techniques, so many commercial products available for PRP preparation. And which leads to uh, formation of different products? What about the biological efficacy of the product? So successive pregnancies have been described in the setting of treated Asherman syndrome or thin endometrial lining after PRP, even without increase in endometrial thickness, suggesting that PRP not only improves the proliferation of endometrial cells, but also the functionality of the cells and receptivity at the molecular level. And it is very appealing because it is safe, it is easy, it is relatively cheap. And often it is the last option before giving up, moving up to alternative options like gestational surrogacy. This is a summary of all the studies that were published on PRP from 2015 onwards. So um, uh, how can you preserve the best interest of your patients? I mean, uh, PRP seems to be the go-to therapy. But remember that the only evidence comes from a small scale and mostly before and after studies, there is no rigorous clinical trial and we have to be very cautious prior to giving PRP on a wide scale basis and should await the uh, well-designed studies. Uh, remember, use of PRP is not approved by the US FDA. It is an off-label use and its use in reproductive medicine should be considered experimental. You should give an honest and a balanced information to your patients. Hysteroscopic evaluation is a priority. If the treatment to increase endometrial growth fails, then additional methods like PRP can be offered after taking an informed consent benefit and risk. And there has to be a special consent for this because it is considered to be a research-based study. Now coming to the role of GCSF. In general, literature is very positive about GCSF, although Practically, we may or may not uh, have had the same experiences. This is a pilot study on GCSF in unresponsive endometrium. And uh, it supported the utility of GCSF for chronically thin endometrium and suggested that such treatment will, in very adversely affected patients, result in low but very reasonable clinical pregnancy rate. They found a change in almost 2 to 2.5 millimeters in the endometrial thickness. So what exactly is GCSF? GCSF is secreted by the apically by the polarized epithelial cells and it has been proposed not only for thin endometrium but also for implantation failure and also in women who have had recurrent miscarriages. Why? Because it has a role in variety of reproductive functions. There is changes of GCSF in the follicular fluid in the menstrual cycle in the granulosa cell. It is linked to oocyte competence even before fertilization. So it has an effect on the egg quality also. 
and uh, this is both autocrine and paracrine effects uh, so it is not mitogenic but it has an interactive fraction with tgf beta 1 so uh, how has it been given remember in implantation failure so if you have people who have failed treatments and recurrent miscarriage it is given subcutaneously rather than intrauterine route and it is given for much longer time period that is almost daily and that is how it has its beneficial effect and um, in general it can benefit uh, uh, pregnancy rates in women who are undergoing IVF the efficacy of intrauterine perfusion in infertile um, women uh, who are undergoing um, thin endometrium treatment this was published in Cochrane in 2017 the current data has shown that intrauterine GCSF can also improve endometrial thickness, clinical pregnancy rate, and embryo implantation rate, but decrease the cycle cancellation rate and in women of thin endometrium. So for thin endometrium, the Cochrane Review has suggested intrauterine installation of GCSF. And how do you put GCSF? So um, it is given by our normal IUI catheter, generally about six to 12 hours before the, so the day before HCG administration. So the content of the ampule is aspirated into a one ml insulin syringe. Then the catheter is introduced into the endometrial cavity as you are doing an IUI. The content of the syringe is injected into the cavity. And at that time, the catheter gently moved back and forth. Upon completion of the injection, the syringe is disconnected, air is aspirated, Again, connected to the catheter, an air bubble is injected. So, the whatever small amount of GCSF was left in the catheter is put in the endometrial cavity. And two days later, if the endometrial thickness is still less than seven, then second infusion of GCSF is given exactly in the same way. So, there's a particular way in which you inject GCSF. Possibly, you do a little bit of uh, forward and backward movement. You might think that this might uh, cause bleeding. However, Blacker and all have published this review where they have had no problems or complications, possibly because it's a gentle uh, movement. Uh, there are two protocols to thin uh, treat um, thin endometrium with GCSF, and the efficacy of both these protocols were investigated. So GCSF was endometrial along with endometrial scratch group nominally higher pregnancy rates than the GCSF only group. So endometrial scratch overall does not impair the GCSF treatment for thin endometrium. It favors pregnancy rates and live birth rates and uh, also reduces the cancellation rates. What is the role of endometrial scratching by itself? Recent studies, you know, it has gone through a cycle. So initially it came, there were so many positive studies. Now then there were some negative studies. And now the evidence that has come is not supporting the role of uh, endometrial mechanical stimulation in an unselected population undergoing IVF. It is considered to be futile. And uh, when you look at the Canadian study, again, for granulocyte stimulating factor, the evidence clinical pregnancy rate is low. So sildenafil and GCSF, these are the two where the evidence seems to be a little more supported in the Canadian trial. What about the role of autologous bone marrow cells? As I said, we do not now call them stem cells. We are using the terminology of autologous bone marrow cells. So there is multiple evidence for this. Some date back to early 1980s because endometrial stem cell or progenital cells are present in the basalis and functional layers of endometrium. They have tremendous regenerative capacity of the endometrial lining during each cycle. So these cells may play an important role in the regeneration of endometrium. And the first human application of this bone marrow cells, stem cells, was in 2011 in a case of thin endometrium 3.6 millimeters secondary to Asherman syndrome, which was refractory to estradiol treatment. So this study was carried out on women of reproductive age between 25 to 35 years, Asherman's grade three or grade four, diagnosed on hysteroscopy, complete amenorrhea or severe hypermenorrhea. There are six women in this study, um, mild degree of intrauterine uh, adhesions, active genital TB, chronic debilitating diseases, and those who are not willing, these are all the exclusion criteria. 
So how was this uh, study done? This is the AIM study. Sorry, I haven't put the title on top. This is the AIM study and uh, the technique that I am also using is following this AIM study. So in this, what has happened is under local anesthesia from the bone marrow, that is from the hip, the patient is placed on the side on the OT table. The patient is given some local anesthesia. Blood is taken from the hip. Uh, about 30 ml from the bone marrow. You can take it from the iliac crest or from the femur. And um, it is collected. The syringe in which you collect should be heparinized. So first you heparinize the syringes. You have to transport it immediately. If you have an in-house uh, CPEX machine where you produce the stem cells, you can do it in-house. And what was done in the AIM study was that they isolated the CD38 cells. Uh, this is the entire um, technical procedure. I'll show you the statistical findings here. <clears throat> so this is the um, data of the patients who are undergoing treatment, their BMI, parity, history of genital TB, FSH, LH level. Take a look at these results. So previous to the procedure, endometrial thickness was 1.2, 1.5 1 millimeter, means absolutely hopeless cases with very thin endometrium. After six months of treatment, so after the bone marrow derived cells, the patients were all put on estrogen and progesterone combination. Take a look at the endometrial thickness, 6.7, 6.2. This is remarkable. This is like a ray of hope for these patients who absolutely had no hope. And what they found was that the only patients excuse me, who did not benefit were the ones who had tuberculosis. The tuberculosis was the uh, primary reason for the failure. So this was the first time reported where the stem cell transplantation was tried in patients of Ashermans and tuberculosis. It is not known whether the inadequate growth of endometrium is due to past endometrial TB or whether, sorry, just excuse me. So it is not known whether it is due to TB or it would have been better with traumatic. Just excuse me for a minute. Hi, just excuse me. <coughs> yeah, okay. And now in the subsequent slides, um, I'll show you an image which we have taken from our OT. So um, this is another study again with the uh, bone marrow derived cells. So this is the needle that is used for the bone marrow biopsy. And this is how the uh, fluid is aspirated. And um, the long here, blue needle that you see, this is uh, injected. You can use the egg collection needle also, or you can use this hysteroscopic needle. And this is how it is injected inside the uterine cavity. And we actually do a blood test to check for the CD4-34 levels to find out how much uh, bone marrow cells we have um, uh, used and how much of the CD4 we have extracted. Now, there are some alternative techniques. For example, acupuncture, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, electroacupuncture. Uh, there are some literature on this, and this has been reported in very good uh, standard journals that um, on the day of HCG trigger, you can get very good uh, endometrial uh, thickness rates by using acupuncture or neuromuscular electrical stimulation with electroacupuncture. Again, published in uh, Middle East Fertility Journal. And uh, compaction. Now, there is another concept that I wanted to just say that there is something called compaction of endometrium. So after you start progesterone and uh, treat, uh, injections, at the time of embryo transfer, if you find that the endometrial thickness is thinner by 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters, do not worry because this is considered to be entirely normal. This concept is called as compaction of endometrium. It can happen by 10%, and it is actually a good sign of receptive endometrium. So there is no need to cancel the cycle. Now, 
there is a concept of estrogen receptor defect and this is what happens in women who have endometrial polyps or endometrial hyperplasia and the treatment in these cases is either to do a polypectomy or to initially do a down regulation so treating patients with thin endometrium is an in fact ongoing challenge and um, <clears throat> In conclusion, uh, most of the evidence for aspirin or estradiol or GCSF is weak. However, so, uh, what we should do is prepare the best seed, prepare the soil, plant at the appropriate time. So start by doing what is necessary, do what is possible, suddenly you're doing the impossible. Thank you, thank you very much to the academic team of Lupin for this wonderful initiative, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was a wonderful talk and you have presented the topic of thin endometrium very classically, showing the consequences, the symptoms, the causes and what would be the effective treatment options which will benefit the patients for her, definitely her pregnancy or if she is non-pregnant though. Uh, ma'am, we have received some questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to put one question to you uh, from our audience. Uh, somewhere from Madhya Pradesh, this question has come. Uh, from Dr. Kulkarni. Uh, Madam, for a woman in her day-to-day -day life, how to judge the symptoms of a thin endometrium as the lady is not uh, married? Um, hypomenorrhea is the primary symptom. And if you want to quantify the blood loss, it is considered to be less than 30 ml. So a duration of bleeding, which is um, less than two days, or the volume, this would be the way to judge. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, there is one question from uh, Jaipur by Dr. Nara. Uh, he has asked uh, that uh, if a thin endometrium, uh, and if the lady is totally unaware about the fact that she is having a thin endometrium, and in a while she conceives, what would be the consequences? Can they save? Uh, uh, pregnancy or what should be the further treatment actions? Uh, so as I mentioned, thin endometrium can be associated with ectopic pregnancies, with recurrent miscarriages and with poor placentation, so IUGR, preterm deliveries. So it can have a lot of consequences on the reproductive outcome. What can you do about it? I mean, I'm assuming that you are doing some kind of assisted conception treatment because yes, in natural yes. pregnancies, of course, you would never know. So in assisted conception, the techniques that I have mentioned, uh, there is supporting role of estradiol, sildenafil citrate or GCSF injections, which you can give. So these are some of the strategies that you can use to improve the quality of endometrium and reduce the risk of complications. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, there is one more question. As of, uh, hello, hello, support, can you check the video? I think there is some network issue from ma'am side, so okay. just okay. wait. So we will hold for the minute. Yes, yes. Sorry, I lost my electricity. No, 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 no worries, ma'am. So yeah. uh, the question is like, nowadays uh, women prefer uh, uh, the education and everything. Her career has set her on the fronts of a late marriage and a late child. Sometimes they even uh, do a planning, a family planning, and they use a lot of birth control agents or a pills. So does it have any connection or a link between usage of birth control pills and the 
Yes, in fact, nowadays uh, I've started discouraging women from using birth control pills because when I was uh, preparing for this lecture, I had gone through some studies and uh, they had uh, published that birth control pills can be one of the reason for thin endometrium later in life. So uh, do try and discourage from excessive rule of birth uh, use of birth control okay. pills. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the last, uh, I think you have covered almost uh, all the other answers in your talk itself uh, about the extensive methods, what we can, we can do. So there is one last question which uh, we can take it as, uh, can we avoid the problems of thin endometrium since the beginning, that is with any uh, specific diet uses, usage of uh, probiotic vitamins in the earlier stages only? With uh, and uh, time and is there any particular timeline by which a woman can check on herself by doing some test on her uh, visiting a gynecologist? Yeah, definitely. Prevention should be our primary goal, and um, there is so much evidence to support the role of probiotics to prevent uh, thin endometrium. So uh, we we I, I never encourage the use of these gels like these uh, vaginal wash gels. But you can definitely give oral probiotics, which are good for the genital tract. You can use these. You can use vitamin E and vitamin, um, you know, multivitamins for this. So definitely there is a role of probiotics. At what age to start? Uh, there is uh, no study. You know, there are studies which have looked at uh, thin endometrium compared to the age. So it seems to be more prevalent about the age of 35, 45, this age yes. group. So this would be the age group that would be our target age group. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I think uh, we have finished the questions here because you have covered it very uh, beautifully, all the aspects of thin endometrium, what one should do and how they should take care in their future pregnancies, even in the frozen embryo, if it is cycles as well. So it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have you on the uh, dais here. And we would like to uh, have, uh, leverage your support in case of anything, any query comes upon for this topic in future. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, it will be a big honor for me. And uh, at my level, I would like to thank everybody who has been here with us today. I'm so grateful you spared your precious time. You were here and you participated. Thank you, Lupin. And thank you very much, Foxy, E. Sampalp, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Foxy and Alpesh, sir, for this initiative with Lupin. And we would like to contribute in all such different topics always.